Hello, and welcome to our eighth edition of Who Knew? I just have to say, it's so great to look out in the audience and see so many maskless faces and see your smiles, yay! So if that isn't exciting, we have another exciting thing to share, and that's the fact that Bob Cluel will be interviewing uh, retired U.S. Navy Captain Bob Adler. We'll get to hear all about his 26-year-long naval career, as well as his many endeavors post-retirement, including underwater pipelines and nuclear waste. We are airing today's program live on 970, but of course, we have our live audience here as well. And so after the program, we will be taking questions from our audience, and Jessica will come around with a microphone if you do have anything you want to ask Bob. So now, I will turn it over to the Bobs. <laughs> Thank you, Whitney. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's, it is a delight to see so many maskless faces and some pretty good-looking ones, too. So uh, it is, and some of, I haven't seen your face in quite some time, and some of you I've never seen before. So uh, it's great, and it's, I, I'm, I'm happy that we have the opportunity to do that. I want to express a special... Thanks and welcome to Elsie Adler, who is here in the front row, and uh, we're delighted she could make it here this afternoon to have you here. So, to, <laughs> I'm delighted to, to uh, introduce to you Captain Bob Adler, U.S. Navy retired. And I'll go through a little bit of his background before we, we ask, start asking the questions. Uh, Bob was raised in a multi-generational family home on the south side of Chicago during the Depression. From an early age, his sights were set on two goals, leading and learning. His educational achievements are impressive. He spent two years at the Citadel uh, waiting for his appointment to the Naval Academy, which eventually came, where he went and achieved a Bachelor of Science degree and was commissioned an ensign in the U.S. Navy in 1951. Midway through his 26-year career, uh, he spent three years at the Naval Postgraduate School at Monterey, California, studying guided, guided missile technology, where he earned a master's degree in, they didn't have it, in guided missile technology at the time. They just discovered technology like that. He got a master's degree in electrical engineering as a result of that. And later, toward the end of his career, he secured a second master's degree, this time in systems management from the University of California. And he got this degree uh, by studying at night, uh, attending classes at night at the end of a long workday. So, uh, great educational achievements for Bob. He distinguished, uh, his distinguished 26-year naval career took him to responsible positions all over the world. He took part in mine warfare and anti-submarine warfare operations at sea. He commanded two warships, one a minesweeper, the other a destroyer. In 1968, he took his destroyer into the Gulf of Tonkin, providing naval, gun side, naval gunfire support uh, in support of combat operations uh, on land in Vietnam. Later, based upon his guided missile expertise, he became one of the Navy's early space experts. I'll let that sink in for a minute. He represented the U.S. at international conferences at the dawning of the space age. He subsequently played a key role in naval systems integration. Back when they were just coming out with computers, everybody had a different computer, everybody made a different component for a Navy ship, and none of them talked to each other. And Bob was, in the proce Bob was key in the process of making all that work. Upon his retirement from the Navy in 1977, he continued to serve his country's interests, working on projects involving repair of undersea oil pipelines, 
and the disposal of nuclear waste. Bob, still an Eagle Scout and a Cubs fan, uh, resides in the Courtyard Apartments with his lovely wife, Elsie, uh, partner for almost 68 years. Uh, they have three grown children of whom they are, of course, uh, very, very proud. So welcome, Bob. Thanks, Bob. Uh, in your early years, there were two strong influences on your life, a kind of strange pair, Teddy Roosevelt and the Boy Scouts of America. How, how to, tell me how they impacted your life. Yeah, first of all, let me say uh, thank you all for coming. It's nice to see real faces for a while. <laughs> and some of your faces I haven't seen for a long time. Everybody looked the same behind a mask. Uh, as Bob said, I, I grew up in a multi-generational family. I lived with my parents and two brothers younger than I, and uh, my grandmother and grandfather, and uh, they were both immigrants, and they came to the United States in 1890. Uh, my dad was really a merchant, and shortly after, or shortly after, before the Depression, he opened up a shoe store, which he promptly lost a couple years later. But he and my grandfather were always uh, in this, as salesmen, and they worked very hard. And so I knew what hard work looked like. But the big problem with me was I was a pretty sickly kid. I had all the normal childhood diseases, measles, mumps, scarlet fever, um, whooping cough, but worst of all, I had asthma. And, and asthma was very debilitating to me because everything I did, it seemed, I'd get an asthma attack. And that meant I was allergic to about 60 different items. 58 of them I can't remember, but two of them that I do were uh, peanuts and chocolate. And uh, so, uh, and every time I played a sport, I get very winded and really couldn't participate. But because I was sick, I read a lot. And one day I picked up a book and read about the life of Teddy Roosevelt. And I found that Teddy Roosevelt was a sick kid. And he had asthma. And he became president of the United States. So I said, this is the kind of guy that I like. So. Uh, what Teddy Roosevelt did when he was young with asthma, he did things he wasn't supposed to do. And he'd bring on his asthma attacks. So that's what I did. I forced myself uh, to expose myself to things that would cause me to have asthma attacks. And my favorite thing was a Baby Ruth candy bar. And I'll never forget my mother found a wrapper once in the door of a baby with candy bar, and she went ballistic. But Teddy Roosevelt was also an outdoorsman, and here I'm a kid living in the city. So what I decided to do was to join the Boy Scouts. And I was in scouting a great part of my life. Um, and one of the first lessons I learned in Boy Scouts, although pretty basic, was leadership. And that's when I became the assistant patrol leader of the Panther Patrol. And I didn't really realize it at the time, but that's what it was like herding cats. <laughs> and I, I found that that was a leadership thing that I really enjoyed. I later became patrol leader I held a lot of responsible positions in the scouting movement uh, throughout my life. 
uh, I saw my son become an Eagle Scout like I did. And finally, I pinned my crusty old Eagle badge on my grandson. So there was three generations of Eagle Scouts. Those were two very important parts of my life. Great. Thanks, Bob. Um, okay, you're at the Naval Academy for four grueling years, eager to graduate and get out there for your first ship, right? Eager to prove yourself in the modern high-tech Navy. Your first assignment as an ensign was teaching midshipmen how to sail, like sailboats. How did that come about, Bob? And why was it one of your most important assignments? Well, you know, we all go through life and Certain events happen, and at the time, we don't realize what their long-term consequences are and how much it really defines who we are. And I had my orders to go to a ship overseas, and uh, a month before graduation, those orders got modified to report to the Department of Seamanship and Navigation at the Naval Academy to teach the incoming class how to sail. I love sailing, and so I, I, I was looking forward to that. And uh, whereas 97% of my class graduated and went to their ship, about three of us, 3%, stayed to teach. Uh, the, mid, the, the new class of, uh, of midshipmen. <coughs> Excuse me, that summer, that July, my brother, who was also a Naval Academy midshipman, was going through his second, his third year, and he was spending part of the summer that July at Annapolis. And his girlfriend at the time said she'd fix me up with a date one of her sorority sisters. And we did on this Sunday in July. And we went to a private beach where I'd never been before, and never been since. And while I was sitting on the beach, I saw two women walking towards our little group. One of them I recognized, I knew her, she was a crab. And that's uh, in Annapolis, it's called Crabtown. So all the girls from Annapolis are called crabs. That's <laughs> a term piece of, of history. A term of endearment. <coughs> right. I had never seen the other girl in my life, but that was Elsie, and she changed my life. And, the, and I was sitting at that beach where I really shouldn't have been, and I didn't realize until later, Elsie shouldn't have been there either. <clears throat> because she was a, an RN and she was working in a hospital in Baltimore. Her sister and she decided to go to New York for a week. And something came up and her sister couldn't go. So Elsie said, well, I'm going to go home to Annapolis and sit with the folks. Well, that Sunday, <coughs> one of her girlfriends uh, called her up and said, Elsie, Daddy gave me the car for today, and I like to go to the beach, but it's got to be this particular beach, this private beach. So Elsie accepted, and she appeared at that beach. And this is a very important story because this July, we'll, we've known each other for 70 years, and we'll be celebrating our 68th wedding anniversary. Right. Now, the stories you're going <coughs> the stories you're going to hear, she was part of them. I mean, she may have not been physically with me, but she was there. So, <coughs> all the stories you're going to hear the rest of the day, mm -hmm. Elsie was there in one way or another. Great. Thank you, Elsie. 
<laughs> I hope we told that all right, Elsie. Uh, uh, your early sea service was aboard the aircraft carrier USS Tarawa, and you were executive officer then on the landing ship medium rocket USS St. Francis River. Your first command was a newly built minesweeper, the USS Kingbird, which was commissioned in April 1955. Tell us about the commissioning ceremony, the ship, and the concept of mine sweeping. Okay, the commissioning ceremony in the Navy is a time honored tradition. It's the point where the builder of the ship officially turns the ship over to the Navy. I was assigned as a prospective commanding officer to report to the Quincy Adams Yacht Yard in Quincy, Massachusetts. And the reason this ship was being built in a yacht yard was because it was an all wooden ship. Because iron ships attract mines. And they actually used all the metal that used on that ship, including the engines, were made out of non-magnetic material. So that was a first of its kind. A commissioning ceremony is very brief, very formal. Uh, a speaker usually speaks about the ship and tells about a little bit about how it was built and so forth. And then he turns it over to the protect, pr prospective commanding officer. I then read my orders and I say, make the ship come alive. And then the whole crew changes, it runs to their station on the ship. And they turn on all the equipment that they can turn on, which was not much on a minesweeper, but you ought to see it done on an aircraft carrier. It's really fantastic. And that's the ceremony of commissioning. Now, minesweeping is a dangerous sport. There, there's three kinds of mines, basically. One is a moored mine, which means it's anchored to the bottom and is usually sitting below the surface. So when a ship runs into it, it goes boom. There's two other types of mine. One is a mine that detects the magnetic signature of a ship and goes boom. And the third is detects the acoustic or the noise signature of the ship and it goes boom. There's variations on all these kinds of things. But a minesweeper carries a cutting line which is streamed behind the ship with cutters on it, which will cut the cable of the moored mine, and then someone standing up there with a rifle and detonating it. The, uh, you have a big sound hammer that you leave over to the side, which makes sound impulses to stimulate a ship. And then you have a tail, which you drag along behind you, which sends out magnetic pulses, which will also trigger a mine. Um, the mine is a very cheap weapon for small countries because they can use it to cover a whole large area. And the biggest minefield that we ever faced, not me personally, but the Navy was in the invasion of Incheon during the Korean War. Okay, thank you, Bob. Very interesting. Uh, after Monterey, uh, you became the operations officer aboard the, the uh, destroyer USS <coughs> Blandy, part of a hunter-killer or anti-submarine warfare <coughs> group operating off our east coast. What were anti-submarine warfare actions like? Well, during the Cold War, 
Some of you know this, some of you don't. We had Russian submarines patrolling the east coast of the United States. And what the Navy did, they formed two what they call hunter-killer groups, which consisted of an aircraft carrier with specially equipped planes with submarine detection equipment and weapons, uh, eight destroyers, and possibly uh, one of our US submarines. And they had two of these Huck groups. And one would be at sea all the time. We'd go out for two weeks, we'd come back, and the other one go out, and then we'd relieve them. And the purpose of this was twofold was to let the, know, let the Russians know that we were there and to train and, and learn a lot about uh, Russian submarines and work as a team, because that's what we had to do. Uh, it's very difficult to find a submarine because a submarine, the, the, your water is different temperatures or different layers. And that means that the sound waves, because of the different density of the water, may not go below a certain layer. So the smart submarine skipper will know that profile and he'll get below the layer. And we, we were learning tactics we were learning how the Russian submarines worked, what they thought about, and we had, there's two types of sonars that you have. You have a passive sonar, which is basically a long range sonar, not very accurate. You can always get a line of bearing, but you don't know how far away he is. And, and there's a lot of noise in the ocean, and sometimes, a whale can sound like a submarine. So we had sometimes problems identifying what it was we had a contact with. And then you have an active sonar which sends out a ping and it bounces back just like radar does. And, and that's used for close in attack on submarines. But it was a learning experience for us. Uh, and we learned a lot about Russian submarines um, as part of that training. Right. Uh, get, get back to your, your uh, training at Monterey as a guided, guided missile warfare uh, and, and guided, guided missile operations. Uh, when you were assigned to London, you were assigned to the Office of, of Naval Research there. Uh, as a scientific officer. And it's kind of a very unusual assignment at a very interesting time, about 1962 or so. Um, and so let's talk about that a little bit. First of all, I understand that getting there was part of the fun. Yeah. Well, that, to me, that turned out to be probably the most exciting assignment I ever had. Um, we got orders, the family got orders to go to London, totally unexpected. I was to go as the scientific liaison officer for astronautics and missiles for the Office of Naval Research. Um, I sort of qualified for this because of the postgraduate course I took. Uh, the Navy put us on the SS United States to take us to England. And in those days, there were not any cruise ships. They had ocean liners, Queen Elizabeth and the United States, the Normandy. They all were just transported people from the United States to Europe. Uh, they put us in first class which was unbelievable. And, and, the, and the kids were, what, 
three, four, and five at the time, and they took care of the kids, and everybody took care of mom and dad. So we get to London after this enjoyable voyage. Um, they put us up in a guest house while we're looking for a place to live. And I go into my office and started getting acquainted with my new job, which I wasn't really too sure what I was supposed to do. But so, it, so be it. And one day a boss calls me in and he says, Bob, we want you to go to Bulgaria. Well, that, I had no idea where Bulgaria was, except it was <laughs> out there somewhere. And so I started looking up Bulgaria on the map. I saw it was about 200 miles uh, wide from east to west, a very small country. On the western side was Sofia, the capital. On the eastern side was the Varna and the Black Sea. The occasion for this visit was they had an international astronautics conference in Varna on the Black Sea. And I was to go as part of the U.S. delegation. And they brought me over to the American Embassy in, uh, in London. And between the U.S. and British intelligence, I spent on and off two days getting debriefed on who everybody was and what it was all about because everybody at that time was interested in who was going to go to the moon first. So there was a lot of activity in the early 60s whether the Russians were going to go to the moon or we were going to go to the moon. So they filled me with all this information gave me a little tape recorder with an instant destruct button and told me how to use it. They uh, told me what not to do uh, because they felt that I might be a target for entrapment, and which didn't happen, thank God, but I was made aware of that. What I decided to do, since who goes to Bulgaria, I decided to fly into Sofia and take the train 200 miles to Varna and see some of the countryside, which I did. But my first shock was landing in Sofia. It was at night. And the door opened, and about six uniformed soldiers with Uzis get on a plane. And that was my first view of a different society. They spent a lot of time checking all our passports and all the paperwork. Finally, they put me in a prearranged car and took me to a prearranged hotel. And I saw, be, realized right then and there that I was in deep trouble because I didn't have a clue about the Russian language. It had used a completely different alphabet, and I couldn't even make out what anything said. Uh, that wasn't too bad because I ate dinner at the hotel. But the next day, I got up early to go to the train station, and everything was Bulgaria, and I didn't. Nobody spoke English, and I kept running around saying "Marna, Marna," and finally, someone pointed. And they got me on a train, and I got in this little compartment. And in that little compartment beside myself was a guy from Argentina and a guy from France. And they were both going to the conference. But the fourth passenger was a soldier who I think was Bulgarian, but I never knew, because he didn't say a word the whole trip. We, we talked. Actually, the trip took 12 hours. I mean, it was 200 mile country, and we must have stopped everywhere. But it was a beautiful country. It actually reminded me a lot of Italy. I mean, a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables, 
and that people even spoke with their hands, which was interesting. Anyway, um, we finally get there. I, I go to this conference. Um, I'm very careful. I stay as close as I can to the American delegation. Uh, but I went on some tours. And on this tour, I went on two tours. They weren't very interesting, but what the? So I'd see this little man following us. And it was just like out of a, an old movie. He had on a trench coat and a fedora hat. And every time I'd sort of look around, he ducked behind something. Now, I'm not sure. I think he must have been following the tour because I never saw him when I was by myself. But I had an 8 millimeter camera. And once I was taking pictures, and I just did it like that and got a picture of him. So I do have him on film, <laughs> this little guy hiding behind the building. Uh, the rest of the trip was somewhat uneventful until I tried to go home. And that was the scary part. Uh, I booked uh, Bulgarian Airlines to Vienna. When we get to the airport, the plane was supposed to leave at about 11 o'clock. Get there about 10, 11 o'clock, and we're all still sitting there. And they started about 12 calling single names. And people would get up, and they'd walk, and they'd hand them back. They had your passport this whole time. They'd hand them the passport and look them over, and then they'd go and get on the plane. This went on for about two hours. And by the end of two hours, there was myself and three other Americans still sitting there. And our name hadn't been called. And it was like about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. You know. And I didn't know what was happening. So I got one of the young kids who spoke English, college kids who were part of the thing. And I called this guy over. And I said, hey, could you tell me what, what's going on? And he said, well, he said, I don't know. Let me find out. So and about 10 minutes later, he comes back to me. And he says, we got a problem. And I go, oh, God. What's the problem? He said, well, they can't figure out you have an American passport, but you have your visa from the Bulgarian embassy in London. I said, that's easy. I said, because I live in London, and I had to go to the Bulgarian embassy. He says, OK, I'll see what I can do. So he disappears. He doesn't come back for about 45 minutes. And he says, I think we might be OK. So we sat there for maybe another half an hour. Finally, they called my name. And they called one other guy's name. And we got on the plane and went bye-bye. And I never knew what happened to those other two guys. I mean, I, I, I didn't know them. They were Americans. And they probably did get home safely. And they might still be there. Might still be. I don't know. Who knows? Is it true that what you used to work, routinely wear to work a bowler hat? Or is that just propaganda? No, that's not propaganda. <laughs> I, I decided if you're in England, do what England did. And I did buy myself a bowler. And I bought myself a brolly, which is an umbrella. And that was very useful. Because, you know, the English, they stand in queue to get on the bus. And when the bus pulls up, supposedly the orderly uh, get on the bus in the order that they were standing there. But some of them took their brawlies and stuck it out so you couldn't get by. And so that's what I brought a brawly for, <laughs> even though I did use it in the rain. Great. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the thought of you in a, in a bowler with a brawly is very intriguing. Uh, in uh, June of 1968, you assumed command of the USS Tossig, a destroyer in the Gulf of Tonkin, off the coast of Vietnam. 
Tell us about operations in the Gulf of Tonkin and what it was like to be in command of a warship in combat. Well, let me, let me talk a little bit about command. Command of any ship is a real experience, no matter what size. And there's a number of things that every commanding officer has to think about. And number one, that wherever you are, whatever you do, you are the United States. So if you do something good, that's fine. If you don't, that's not so good. So you got to remember you're a piece of America wherever you are. Secondly, uh, you have a crew on the Tossig. We had a crew of about 250 men from all over the United States. And uh, they were my responsibility. And I considered the most important thing that my job was morale. And if you didn't have good morale, you didn't have a team. If you didn't have a team, you didn't have a ship. Because don't forget, this was a place where people lived it was their home. Uh, they ate three meals a day there. They slept. Uh, they fixed and operated very complicated technical equipment. Uh, and the whole ship was a fighting unit. If one part, part of the ship wasn't working, either because the men weren't well trained or had poor morale or the equipment was broken, you were in deep trouble and you couldn't do your job. Of course, when the destroyer is built to go in harm's way, it has many missions. Uh, and one of the missions it has is gunfire support. And gunfire support means that you've got troops on the beach and they're in trouble or they see something and they do what's called call fire. They'll call you up and they'll say, uh, I give you a coordinate and tell you what the target is and then you shoot and setting those coordinates in. Then they'll spot for you because they're either on the ground near the spot or they're in a small airplane and they'll tell you to move right or up or down or whatever, then you adjust it and shoot again until you hear fire for effect, and then you shoot everything you got. Now, the Tossig was probably one of two ships at that time in Vietnam who had six five-inch guns. The Navy had taken most of its guns off its ships and put missiles on them, which was fine. But it's awful hard to shoot a missile at a small ammunition dump in the middle of the jungle. Uh, so I got a lot of work. Other things we did, we, we w ran with the carriers because we had to provide air and submarine defense for the carriers. Although the Vietnamese didn't have any submarines, you never knew. And um, we, we also uh, could pick up down pilots. Uh, sometimes uh, a, a pilot would be coming back from a mission and have to ditch his plane and we'd go retrieve him. Or else he'd get a cold shot off the carrier and go in right off the carrier and we'd have to go in and pick him up. Um, so, uh, but you know, it, it, it's a good responsibility. It's a very exciting thing that happens. It's uh, one of the things I went into the Navy for was to get command of a ship. And I was very lucky to have two commands, one in combat. 
coming home from Vietnam. That trip started badly. Tell us about why that happened. Yeah, I, I, I made two tours in Vietnam with the ship. The second tour, um, we'd been there six months. It was time to go home. Uh, there was five destroyers. And we all started from Yakuska. And we actually started a day earlier because there was a typhoon down south. And a typhoon is what they call a hurricane in the Pacific. And it's the same thing. Terrible. So we thought we'd get ahead of it a day and do what they call crossing the T, getting ahead and onto the other side of the typhoon where the seas are not that severe. Uh, we started out with good intentions, but a couple of things happened. The typhoon took a curve towards us and picked up speed. And we were in this terrible sea or I guess the waves, maybe I'm exaggerating, but it, I always remember them about 50 feet high. And it was very scary. And what you had to do is you had to keep your bow pointed into the waves. And because if you got into what you call the trough between the waves, the ship may capsize. So the, the main thing you had to do was to keep the bow into the waves. And I'd been through a number of typhoons and, and hurricanes in my Navy career. But this is the first time I've ever been in charge of one. I've ever been the CO. And I, I, would, I always saw how it was done, but I had never done it. So here I find myself, uh, and everybody looking at me like they knew what I was doing, and I was hoping I was doing right. But it, it got sometimes very difficult, because sometimes when you're plunging like this, the, the rear end of the ship will come out of the water, and you lose your rudder and your engines. And so you start falling off. And so you got to take drastic action. You, and it, sometimes throwing your rudder over all the way was not enough. You had to take your engines and push one of them forward full and the other one back full to put a twist on the ship to keep your, your bow in, into the way. Well, we went through this for about 12 hours, and we found out that we were really only making about five nautical miles an hour. And if we didn't do something, we were really going to get slammed. Because the other thing you got to worry about on a destroyer, uh, and other ships, but a destroyer more so, is that they're top heavy, and, and they need ballast. And ballast means you need a heavy weight on the bottom of the ship so to, to counteract the high uh, weight on the top. And, and what you use for that ballast is your fuel oil. And however, when you're steaming for a while, you burn up that fuel oil. And you got to then fill it in with seawater, which is okay, but you got to be careful that you don't mix the fuel oil with the seawater, otherwise you're going to lose an engine uh, or you're going to lose a boiler, which is what was driving your engines. So uh, we decided to, to go, go back to Yakuska. And so we basically turned around and headed home. But now we had a different problem. We had the waves behind us. So it was lifting us up from behind and throwing us down. 
which wasn't as dangerous, but it was very scary. So we finally got back to Yakuska, spent two days there, waiting for the storm to disappear, which it did. And then we turned around and headed home again. And the kids and Elsie were waiting because I'd promised to take them to Disney World. <laughs> <laughs> and, but they were there and they were waiting on the beach. Great. Bob, Bob we're running a little short here, uh, but I uh, want to get to the jobs you had after you retired. You retired in 57. You worked in systems engineering jobs in San Antonio, Texas, and in Crystal City, Northern Virginia. Yep. Tell us about it. Well, um, I took this job. I wanted to do something different. I didn't want to do what I was doing. I wanted to get away from it. So I took this job with a company called Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio, Texas. And they hired me as a program manager to build an underwater pipeline repair system. The, un the unusual thing about it, they wanted to repair pipelines down to 2,000 feet. And they couldn't weld. They couldn't have send people down there to weld at that depth. So they designed this system where you would basically send a chamber down where the pipe needed welding and evacuate all the air from it and then send a diving bill with men and they'd get down there and they would do the welding under what they call the single atmosphere system. That was one of my projects. Uh, I worked very shortly on a project for Electric Power Research Institute uh, testing electric power towers. But I really got involved in, in nuclear waste. The company won the contract to establish what they call the Souk Center for Nuclear Waste Regulatory Analysis. And that was to assist the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to license a nuclear waste repository at Yucca Mountain. Now the government in, 19, in the 1980s promised the utilities that they would find a storage facility for the spent nuclear rods. All nuclear facilities have these nuclear rods and after a while they have to be replaced but they're still radioactive. So all the nuclear power plants had to put them in a pool of water to shield them from radiation. So the government was going to build this site at Yucca Mountain, which was 100 miles north of uh, Las Vegas, near the old Nevada test site. And they were going to dig into this mountain, and they were going to put these rods in the casts and bury them in this mountain. Well, that never happened. The mountain's all dug out. Uh, it's um, ready to receive waste. But it got canceled during the Obama administration, and, I, and the waste is still sitting there uh, at, the, um, at, at, the, at all your reactors. Uh, but that was a very exciting job. Uh, they put me in charge of the Washington office, and I worked very closely with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in, in licensing it, because it was the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's job to license all the nuclear reactors. So, and, and there were some tough rules. I mean, it had to last for 10,000 years. You know, no one knew what they were talking about. How can you, how can you figure out something that's going to last for ten thousand years? But anyway, um, that um, 
basically finished my active career and I, I learned how to play golf better and finally moved to Westminster Camera to get a rest. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Bob. Whitney? Wonderful. Thank you so much and thank you for your service. Uh, now we'd like to open it up to our audience if anyone has any questions and Jessica will come around with a microphone. So just raise your hand. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Paul Galanti, I went to the boat school too, Captain, a long time after you. But I think one thing that you, you didn't stress and you should have with your skipper of the ship, all those guys from the lowest seaman up to your executive officer, they're like, you don't get an ounce of sleep at night worrying about all their personal problems and all the other stuff you have. It's one of the things nobody says about the captain of a ship, but that was your biggest thing. I'd be willing to bet you have some stories to tell about uh, trying to keep morale when half the crew is getting divorced or getting nasty letters from home or any of that stuff. But I think one or two of those might be interesting to the group of when you were a captain of the Tossic. So, Did I hear that? Well, um, it goes back to morale and keeping morale on your ship. And with all of your crewmen and even the executives on the ship, you probably had to deal with them and some of their personal issues. So any um, stories pertaining to that? Yeah, well, uh, you know, morale is a very complex thing because you got to keep people happy. And first of all, you're far away from home and you're living on this environment and uh, you got to make sure the food is good. Uh, you find out that between you and the executive officer, you're somewhat of a chaplain. Uh, people come to you with problems. There's no one else they could talk to. And um, so you got to do the best you can. Now, if, if you're ashore, then there's facilities that can take care of that. But the other thing in morale is that uh, the uh, armed forces uh, have what they call the Uniform Code of Military Justice. And you were also the sheriff. You were also the judge and you were also the jury. And uh, the captain of a ship had the power to hold captain's mast. And he was able to deal out punishment, minor punishment, but punishment nevertheless. Or he could recommend one of two types of court martials. One of the summary court martial and one is a special court martial. And I'll leave the lawyers to explain that, but they're, they're a little higher level for more serious offenses. Uh, so you had to, you know, make sure that people were well fed, or well taken care of. Um, it's a very complex thing. And because you're dealing with couple hundred different people and uh, you're expecting them to to do the best job they can so you really owe it to them to keep the morale going I can't hear anything. The question is, one of the articles in the paper was in a reply to a suggestion that the Pentagon, Pentagon budget should be cut. In the reply, one of the part of the reply to that was that our current Navy does not have enough up-to-date equipment and doesn't have enough equipment. And linked to that 
they said it would be inadequate to face the Chinese policy of taking over more of the waterways. Oh, do you feel that's um, uh, true? Well, the problem changes with time, but it's always there. And you have a certain number of ships, and some of those ships are at sea, and some of those ships are at home port, and some of those ships are under repair or moder modernization. And if you don't do those kinds of things, and then your morale suffers, your mechanical problems get bigger, and if you try to overextend the operational status, which we're doing right now, I mean, we're, uh, we don't have enough ships to meet the commitments that we have made. So we use the ships uh, and don't give them enough time. As you recall, a few years ago, we had a couple of major accidents. And um, actually, both of them, the destroyers, and McCain and the Fitzgeralds. Uh, and there was other, there's other smaller ones that never really made the press. Uh, and that's because the, the people are pushed hard the equipment is pushed hard. And, uh, you know, Reagan wanted a, a big Navy, and he almost made it. And then after Reagan left, it went down. And uh, you, you gotta, you, if you make a commitment to do something, you got to really make a commitment to the people who are going to fulfill that commitment. Uh, so they, uh, they can do their job. We have one more question. I wondered when you were on the aircraft carrier Tarawa because my husband served on that aircraft carrier in 1951. In what year? 50, 1951. That's when I was there. No kidding. Yeah. <laughs> what a small world. <laughs> he never, well, I know he saw some pretty bad, he, accidents of planes that didn't make it taking off or yeah, coming that, back. Well, that was an interesting time because, don't forget, that was, the Korean War had just recently broken out, mm -hmm. and a lot of flyers, had been recalled, uh, you know, who were in World War II, got recalled into in the service, and the Tarawa had a couple of squadrons of these recalled reservists who were now all lieutenants and had gone off and started their life anew, and then they got called back uh, to fly airplanes. And, and actually, they called themselves the Bitter Birds because they were not a happy group of people. And, and there were a lot of accidents. In fact, I think one cruise, there were seven. Uh, we lost seven pilots, and that was pretty high. Well, he didn't tell a whole lot of stories, but about 20-some years ago, with two small, two young grandsons, we toured the aircraft carrier in the Hudson River, New York, um, part of that museum. Oh, of yeah, ships. right. Ships. And then he was just full of stories. <laughs> well, you know, uh, not all of you were here, but, but Whitney, what was it two years ago? Three. Yeah, three. maybe mm -hmm. three. I don't know. We went, she took a bunch of us on uh, George W. Bush in Norfolk, and that was an experience even for me. Uh, first of all, I could hardly get up the ladders. <laughs> there were a lot and of I, ladders. I, I, could, I couldn't realize that I used to go up and down those things a hundred times a day. But I had a bad time that day. But we had a, that was a good, good tour.
tour we had that time. That's right. We were right in there. Um, yeah. It was tight and it was tall. <laughs> and a George, the George Bush, I'm telling you, is nothing like the carrier that I was on. The, the Tarawa was the, actually the last of the World War II carriers. It was a hull number 40, and uh, it was uh, built right at the end of the war. And after that, they started building the supercarriers. And they're really something to see. Unbelievable. Yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I believe Bob Kluhl has a couple of announcements, and then we will call it a day. Okay, I want to let you all know that there will be a ceremony of remembrance marking the observance of Memorial Day this year. Uh, it's a production made by our residents. It will air on TV 970, and uh, it really is an update of last year's presentation. It will be shown uh, on Memorial Day, Monday, May 31st, three times, 11 a.m., 2 p.m., and 6 p.m. And next, uh, June 16th, uh, at 3 p.m. in the afternoon is our next Who, Who Knew? Uh, and this will feature Miriam Sigler. M Miriam was born in Colombia. She was educated there by French nuns. Um, then in Panama, she became a Spanish language translator and then an interpreter. And after marrying her husband Bill in 61, she came to the United States and she served for 30 years as a contract employee for the State Department. And she was an interpreter during diplomatic and trade negotiations, uh, conferences, seminars, social functions at the White House, at the Pentagon, Department of Justice, FBI, and other federal government agencies. She, as an interpreter, she brings a very unique perspective because if, if an important person tries to talk somebody in, uh, from a different country, uh, what gets said is not what he said, it's what the interpreter says. Um, she brings a valuable perspective and an abundance of interesting stories, so you should look forward to that next June, uh, this coming June 16th. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Mr. Adler. Thank you for your service. You. We really appreciate it.